All right, so just before we start the panel discussion, I just wanted to take a few seconds, because for me, um, when I was talking earlier about uh, looking these videos on YouTube and being inspired, um, I'm now here on a panel that, with people that have inspired me myself and are still inspiring me. Um, so I'm glad to be here now inviting them uh, to NeuroTechX event. And I think that what Connor brought up in his uh, presentation is really about these tools that we're building right now. These are not the end technology. These are not perfect at the moment nor the science about the brain is not uh, perfect, but it's really about where we're moving, about inspiring and empowering people uh, for uh, what's coming next. And I think that's really uh, how the technology should be looked at uh, for the technology that like uh, the headset that we're seeing there. Uh, these are what's going to enable the next generation of product, and these are really, it's really about the inspiration of the next generation. And I'm here with people that have inspired me. Uh, uh, Dan gave an amazing uh, TEDx, well, a TED talk earlier uh, last year, was it? 2014, about neuroscience meet hackers. And that is a TED talk that I just like watch on a regular basis because I think this, this is really uh, like the mission of Neurotech X. And I'll let him introduce himself a little, a few minutes, and after that, we'll just start uh, the panel discussion about, uh, and Melanie is going to be leading the panel. Cool. Thank you, Yannick. I'm going to start with uh, what's going to sound like a pretty sardonic quote. Um, but years ago, I was, I was in an argument with a friend who is a, a med student, and he said that nobody who sets out to change the world actually changes the world. The, the people that actually move the needle are people that pick one thing, commit deeply to that, and after years and years and years of effort, then you start creating a contribution, then you really start actually changing the world. And that really stuck with me. Um, and it started as such a negative comment, but the more I think about it, the more it becomes positive. And when you think about that, I look at what uh, Amy and Connor have done over years and years and years of pushing the needle, creating a reaction from an established group of people that have a very specific political landscape. Uh, now they really are creating this amazing contribution from years and years and years of effort. So these are people that I've, I've been very good friends with for years. Um, but this is the first time I've ever sat on a panel, so I'm totally thrilled. Um, Okay, so about me, um, it, the exact same thing, where um, I didn't want to just change the world, I wanted to commit deeply to something, and for me that's neurotech. Um, it, in my career, I've been a professional engineer, designer, entrepreneur, and scientist, um, uh, but now I want to take all these different worlds and invest them into neurotechnology. So currently, I'm a graduate student at MIT. I'm working at Boyden Synthetic Neurobiology Lab. The core of what I do is taking computational methods or, uh, to process this enormous amount of data that's coming in, but we look at ourselves as tool builders. So we have built several technologies over the course of our history and moving forward uh, to try to empower new generations of neuroscientists to do science in their lab. And part of this also is, I see it as this, the essential, like an essential element for the progress of science is doing exactly like what we're doing tonight. Uh, Corey Bargman, uh, one of the famous, famous neuroscientists alive now, said that uh, science, the true, creative science is bottom up, not top down. And I thought Amy totally nailed it with the idea of this, sometimes science can be afraid. Um, the traditional science, grant-based science, reputation-based science, like that can be, become so afraid of a, of a, a false positive uh, that oftentimes you don't get the chance to explore for fun. Um, and so, I, you know, I learned that, you know, before I went back, when I was in the design world, we explore, we, we live on the idea of provocations and little kernels of idea, and let's try it, and if it doesn't work out, that's okay, let's learn from that and move forward. A great example is I was just talking with a classmate, Nick, um, with, um, from this last semester at MIT, and he did this really cool project with EEG. I thought, and, and we were talking, and the first thing I said is, you should put that on openbci.com. And first of all, like that, that is an indicator of the contribution of what you've done. The fact that this can be a classroom situation, you know, at MIT saying, you know what, like, you did something really cool in the classroom, where that can have the most impact is on openbci.com. And the, the, the dialogue of saying, well, what if that's a false positive? You know, and the whole idea of framing it is like, hey, this is a contribution to the community. Here's an idea. Let's talk it out. And if the community can disprove it in a constructive way, then that's, that's a value add, and that's positive. Um, and I think that's, to me, I think that's a really good little case study of what, what comes from this. And so I didn't talk much about myself. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, anyway, like I, um, Let Melanie ask you a personal question. Yeah. Yeah. Other <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I built some stuff, now I'm, a, I'm, now I'm just a grad student. 
Yeah. Just a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> just an MIT grad student. Just a grad student. Lab. So that actually brings up one of like the major questions that I've been really excited to talk to you all about all night. In terms of false positives being published on the internet, I sort of understand where researchers are coming from, especially when something is being publicized so broadly. Do you have any constructive suggestions for how you can just publish things out into the world while still making sure that people aren't interpreting those claims in a way that's harmful to them? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the it's all about setting expectation, right? So, and, and you hear this phrase, you hear this a lot in the corporate setting, right? Like, what does success look like? Or what are the expectations of contribution? If you say, when you publish a, a peer-reviewed paper in Science, Nature, one of those, then the expectation is that this is 100% correct. And if you can disprove that, then that is a horrible thing for what I've just put out. Right? <laughs> but in community forums, setting the expectation of this is an interesting idea, I've been stewing on this for a while, can I get, like, let's talk about it. I think, I think that is, that is a, a future um, that really doesn't exist enough right now. So, yeah, kind of, this is a tertiary, but related. Um, you know, one thing, so with this kind of emergence of neurotechnology and, you know, this excitement around brain tech and, you know, what can we do with this, uh, one thing that's kind of bugged me, over, and, you know, OpenBCI in some ways is guilty of this by not uh, saying no to people, but I see a lot of articles that come out which is like, you know, brain control robot or mind control robot this, and, and kind of just this like, this relentless um, overselling, exactly like Dan was saying, of, of the capabilities of the technology, and ultimately that, you know, it's setting the expectations too high. So, you know, for me, I, I read these articles and I'm like, I've seen that. I saw this five years ago. This is the same thing that's been done for the last five years, which is like classifying some attention score and then mapping it to one output of a robot and then saying it's a mind control robot when really this person has no control. Um, and I think like you know this is detrimental because there's all this excitement and this this around the novelty factor of brain control this and mind control that. But you saw the power of a muscle controlled system, and you know and then you then you hear the fact of like 90% of ALS people patients actually still have motor function. And so you, you wonder how many resources are going into the innovation of a technology that's unnecessary and not practical. How, how do we like kind of bring people back down to earth and say like, why are we skipping past this like, you know, less sexy technology that could be actually applied in a practical and widespread way? So, you know, that's, I think part of what we have to do is ensure that like, if we are working with a journalist or someone who's covering our technology or our innovation, you know, really push the point, like, Look, cover this accurately. Make sure that when you write about this, you're not selling it as something better than it is. So, and I think that's true for science and all forms of technology. Yeah. So, I just want to add some, just my perspective to this is that in some way, you can't prevent all people from, you know, absorbing wrong information, right? We live in an age of BuzzFeed lists of like, oh, it's the reasons why whiskey is great for your health. Like, oh, that's awesome. That's just what I wanted to hear. Or, you know, like, oh, now we know all memories worked. You know, like check it, we're done. Um, I think I think the only way to really combat that is to figure out how to incite curiosity in people, and I think that's why I'm so interested in design, you know, in science because you know it is it's the same way that the Exploratorium in San Francisco really pushes people to explore rather than learn. Like if you can somehow give people on the internet something that sparks their curiosity then that you know, will give them the motivation to read more than just the headline or the tweet about the article, and read the article and maybe dig deeper on their own. And so I think that's something that scientists often don't think about, but I'm hoping that you know, people like Dan coming into the field, like you know, everybody's getting like this huge influx of design thinking into the scientific community. Hopefully we can consider that when we kind of put research out. Um, just building on top, on top of this, because I think that we have really something powerful that was not necessarily there before, which is the wow factor, uh, brain control stuff. I think that it's our role uh, as a society to kind of like mitigate that uh, what we do and what we set, what we send out there, because we won't be able to control the information, all all the information. But I think that we should use that, like because people like myself, I was inspired at first by mind control stuff. 
now that I'm doing my PhD in neuroscience, I know what mind control really stands for, uh, and the, the, the limited uh, power of brain interfaces right now. Uh, but I was empowered for I was inspired first, and now I'm doing my PhD in this because of that, because I was reading and watching all these videos, uh, and I think so. That I think that the wow factor is really powerful, but we need to like just kind of like take care and make sure that we, we make the most out of this wow factor when we actually use these words to make sure that it actually counts and it's just like not just for uh, getting some uh, tweet baits and stuff like that. Yeah. I really, yeah, I think there's, I totally agree with what you guys are saying. Because um, there's something to be said about dreams and wild ideas, you know, and in, so part of my background is I was an entrepreneur in residence at IDEO, which is a global design firm, and there we live on provocations. And so, you know, what is, you know, how might we design the future of this? And for, for whatever reason, sometimes science doesn't operate on that. Sometimes science is afraid to say, like, you know, how might we define consciousness? It's funny, um, because it's, it's such a hard, well, okay, one of the most darkest quotes about science I've heard is that we, it doesn't look for truth, it looks for answers to publishable questions. <laughs> uh, but when you, if you can take these different energies from these different worlds, so design world lives on provocation, you know, the, the hacker community lives on curiosity and meritocracy. Um, the entrepreneurship world lives on opportunities. And so the, fi the finding these intersections, I think, uh, with, with reasonable expectations, it is absolutely the, the right steps forward. Questions? So if we are going into this like utopian future where everyone <laughs> can contribute to science and have their results be public, okay, quasi-utopian, semi-future. We're on our way. <laughs> that sounded more bleak. When Donald it. Trump is president. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, so if everyone can contribute their ideas and everyone's ideas get published and ideally these ideas are fantastic, how does someone go about making a living off of that? Because I think one of the draws of becoming a research scientist is, is that it gives you food. <laughs> <laughs> Not much of it, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll think about what it, okay. What I think what is changing is credit. Uh, and I don't really know how to define, I, I, we don't really know how it's going to change. But let's say, like, in the old way of saying, academic, how good of an academic are you? You'd say, well, what was your journal? How many papers have you published? Who have you published with? But there's, there's things that are changing. Um, so a great example of this is in neuroscience now, we talk about tools being really useful, but we're now seeing an increase in infrastructure as a tool. So as more and more data gets created, not every neuroscientist knows how to use these tools. They know knows how to program, so they need to start using these tools on top of that to facilitate their own science. Now, the people that are building those tools aren't getting published like you used to imagine getting published. But those, what they're doing, are ext it's extremely important and appreciated by the community. And that appreciation can turn into faculty jobs. There's this new term, research software engineer, that's coming into academia, specifically in England. Um, yeah, I hope that's going to flood in here. So I think the whole idea is that um, how does that generate food on the table? I'm, I'm stepping one. That's downstream to the idea of what what it, what is credit, uh, and I think that that is changing rapidly. Yeah, and, and I would add that like, if you start out by thinking about how you're going to get paid for it, that that's not the right way to start. I mean, like, like I, I started IY, I, I met Dan when I was at this first brainstorming session that Sebastian said who started IY, I put together in Palo Alto. And I like, I met Sebastian at TED, and then we kept in touch over the years because I would always write these questions like, what's consciousness, what's your idea? And he'd be like, read the book, Amy. No one knows. <laughs> so then when I saw IY, I was like, this is great, but I don't understand why you built it. Like, what, what is it? Like, you need to teach people about it. And I volunteered my time for an entire week and like flew out to Palo Alto and like Dan taught me how to do brainstorm sessions. Like I flew out to do brainstorm sessions and didn't know what I was doing at all. And then when I was there, Sebastian started recruiting me to join and I, that seemed absurd to me at the time. But I think if you just are very passionate about what you're doing and you bring your own perspective and your own you know, kind of angle to it, then somehow, sometimes, I think you will end up getting paid in ways that you could have never anticipated at the beginning, and especially kind of with this whole crop of like neurotech and you know, VC firms just for like, you know, neuro, neuroscience like startup incubators are kind of starting to pop up now. I mean, there's lots of opportunity to be innovative you know, within the academic world and beyond it. 
Yeah, great, great response. Um, the, you know, I think I don't have as much of a perspective on kind of like the, the core researcher, um, but you know, I'm, I am one of the tool builders. So, you know, I don't do science, but I listen to scientists and I get feedback from scientists about how do I, how do I build better tools for you. Um, but this, I think this also applies to, you know, outside of just the scientific institution. Like, you know, when we first started OpenBCI, we launched a super successful Kickstarter campaign and then we had a number of conversations with investors and most of them were like, okay, so you're open source. Um, what, you know, like, what can I own? What can I, like, how can I buy a piece of you? And we were like, uh, do you like what we do? Yes, we do. But what, like, where, do you have a patent? Do you have da da da? And we're like, nope, we don't have any patents. And so it's, it's been this kind of like, it's been, uh, you know, with OpenBCI, it's been an exploration of neurotechnology as much as it has been an exploration of new forms of business. Because, um, but I think the point I'm getting to basically is that we are not just surviving, we're flourishing as a company because people are giving us credit. So people will respect us, the community respects us, and, you know, all of the funding for OpenBCI is bottom up funding. We have not taken a single investment. It's all people who believe in what we're doing and appreciate the fact that we're distributing this content back into the wild. And I think so, like today we have this rare and unique opportunity to um, turn credit into money because we have these, like, these amazing, this amazing infrastructure for sharing what we do. So you know, like things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, just social media platforms in general, we have the opportunity to like broadcast, look, like we're doing this for something more than just making a bunch of money. You know, we're doing this because we care about it and we're passionate about it. And I think it's like, you know, it applies to both research and technological innovation. People are starting to get it, and you're, and you're seeing novel forms of businesses emerge that aren't following the stereotypical kind of like top-down model where it's just like VC comes in, buys an idea, boom, off it goes. Um, so that's my response. Not that, it's, not that other forms of business are, are bad and evil, I think. Like, <laughs> I'm saying there are other options and like, you know, there are great VCs and great investors out there who make passionate investments and, and want to see the industry grow, but I just think that there, there are more ways, so. Yeah. And perhaps we don't know exactly where the value is going to be yet. You know what I mean? Like, to take us, okay, I'm really not going to do the entrepreneur cliche of referencing Steve Jobs. I'll walk around that. But, uh, so the Media Lab, at our 30th anniversary, we had the direct, the guy who founded the Media Lab 30 years ago, went up and he said, bio is the new digital. And then the director of the Media Lab said the exact same thing. And I think that's a reasonable push to make. I really, I, mean, I believe that. That's, and, uh, uh, and so if you're going to take the historical perspective, it's not that unreasonable to say, maybe what we're, what, like this, these kernels, what we're doing now is analogous to the Homebrew Computer Club of hobbyist people that are interesting in, interested in computing before computing was a thing. Now, this is people that are interested in exploring the brain before the brain really had this established industry like we have with the PC market now. Um, so I, I think that's kind of that's the joy of, of, of charging in the dark, is that we're the, these lands, it's up to us to colonize uh, the lands that we discover. Do you have anything to add, Yannick? I think, I think <laughs> the, the, the answer pretty, pretty well the question. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of bio as the new digital, I think to everyone on this panel, it is really evident why we're studying neurotechnology specifically, why we think it's important to have open source and crowdsourced neuroscience. What do you think it is about the brain that makes it unique compared to other open source sciences, if anything? <laughs> <laughs> I just because I'm like obsessed with the brain, okay? I, I mean, I think there's one unifying thing about brains that you know, makes us all human. Everybody has one, and I think everyone has some even tiny inkling of curiosity as to like how it works, if not at least to understand what they're what's bothering them, right? Like I, I think that there is some innately human thing about what we are and who we are and how we are who we are, and it's like this great mystery that's all nested in the brain, and we live in this golden era of neuroscience where it's not just scientific labs, and in fact it's this like unprecedented species level innovation where on a global scale people in academia and beyond are like coming together to figure this out. So it's just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that one of the things that the brain is just too important. Uh, 
and everybody kind of like want to learn more and experiment about the brain. We're about to redefine time-wise, it's hard to tell, but what it is to be human. And I would like to just ask a question to, to everybody. If you could implant yourself a chip in your brain, so surgeries, the surgery has no risk, been done a million times, no side effect. Uh, you keep the chip for as many years as you want, and it, there is no side effect. So you just increase your memory, let's say, by tenfold. Okay, so you have a chip in your head, in your brain, and improves your memory tenfold. Who would do it? I would. <laughs> okay, and I think this, like, we have about like 50% more or less uh, in the room that raised their hand. And I think that this is exactly the kind of question that should be, uh, that should involve the public as well, and be open source and be transparent. From the transfer, from the privacy, from so many aspects and angle, and these are a really important question. And if there was a chip, I'd rather have that chip to be kind of like open source and transparent and owned by people, not necessarily by one corporate that might be or not evil that we won't really know in time. Google. So <laughs> Google. So like Google is a really good example. Or a good guy, a bad guy, we'll know later in time. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So that would be my uh, my two cents on the topic. Everything they said. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in by saying, you know, I think we're all here for some reason. We're all curious in the brain for some reason. But now, it, like, what's what's interesting to see is is these other, you know, human ailments begin to be figured out, right? You see, like, cancer is getting identified earlier and earlier. You know, I mean, like, people are still dying by cancer, but not as much as it used to happen. And it seems like within our lifetime, we'll we will have cured cancer. Um, Probably way before any of us die. Uh, hopefully, um, that's a tangent. So, but what I'm saying is, is like we all we all are sitting here, and we've all experienced some either firsthand or secondhand, uh, 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 you know, ourselves or a family member who you know suffer from anxiety or depression or you know uh, had a traumatic brain injury or you know went through Alzheimer's and you, you know like for instance for me like I my grandma had a rare form of cognitive uh, decline where she had Pick's disease disease and I watched someone I loved basically pieces of their mind fall out piece by piece you know and so you have an experience like that and you, you watch a, a form of consciousness or an instance of consciousness that you are so familiar with like fall apart piece by piece and you just like why can't we replace these pieces like I know how they work I can put them back and so it's you know like I think more and more we, were, we are going to reach a state where that is the only thing that prevents us from, you know, from just living and being human. And, you know, and that's why it seems so inevitable and so important that we put tons of resources into brain computer interfaces. And we do it in a way where everyone understands how it works and we do it ethically and uh, yeah, we're all involved in the conversation. So this is a bit of a follow-up question to do with open source discoveries and things like that. If, for instance, we were to find some technology or some application of the technologies that we have that dramatically helps with a certain disease or with a certain condition, whose responsibility is it to keep it up to date? So, for instance, what happens when the next version of the Python code that has been built on is deprecated and people who are relying on this technology no longer have access to it? <laughs> um, I think I, I would I would compare that to what we're building with GirlTechX. I think that people will just naturally, organically take ownership because it's more important. Uh, a lot of people will just like if there is no one, I'll 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 be there. I'll be the one that will do it uh, for things that are just really important. So I mean, if it's just like something that doesn't really help and save lives, but I think that when, when we talk about something that saves lives. We'll always have people that will just volunteer to be uh, to be there, and we'll have the team. And if like the leader just drop for any reason, there will be just someone else that will take the place, and organically, naturally. Maybe I'm just too naive, uh, but I believe that when there is like important causes, people will just stand up and do do it, either volunteer or even pay for such things. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, Melanie. I don't. I guess I I'm having trouble conceptualizing that as a fear. I mean, so I never thought about it. Um, the one thing I would say is that there are very interesting models of private companies using open source projects. And the Linux, you just need to look at the Linux community for examples of that. So I think it's a really interesting question. I need to think more about it. But I think it's a self-writing community, I hope. Yeah, I mean, I, I think 
it's ultimately about accountability, right? Because there's there will probably you know in this scenario we'll reach a point where you have basically different firmware that you can upload to your brain, right? Or or some chip inside of your brain. This is kind of like we're we're getting speculative here, but you know like maybe there are different firmware and some of it is more expensive than others and only certain people can afford this firmware, you know? And it's like you know this is just a, an outlandish scenario, but you know maybe it is feasible. Um, and then I think the same principles that apply today still apply. You know, it's, it's about the general public and the mass population keeping people who could potentially exploit everyone else in check. Um, and just hopefully we continue to do that as we evolve. Do you want to add anything? Okay, so let's take things back to a more positive in terms of really great open source projects that are being worked on that people are already contributing to, if someone is completely new to the field and they watch this panel discussion and they're incredibly inspired to start working on it, what is the first thing they should do? Back us on Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just just be cur curious and start conversations and um, know that now learning is so available. And if you are truly inspired, there is something out there that can take you to the next step, that can take you to, take you to the next level. You know, like um, for instance, that that how to hack toy EEG hack that I referred to earlier. You know, that was that was groundbreaking. I look back on that as literally a turning point in my life, and I think that. That exists out there for everyone. Maybe everybody here has already found that, but um, you know, access to technology and learning is just so. The, the way that the world has changed is, is amazing, and I think that like this, you know, we kind of, we're trying to promote that and, and push it forward. And I think so many people are. Like everyone here definitely feels that way. <laughs> kind of what I was going to say: just research and talk to people and go to events like this. You never know when the next idea is give a start or where you, you're going to discover some way that you can spend five minutes that turns into five hours that turns into a side project that turns into like a new startup. You guys actually hired somebody for a while, right? Who was freely contributing on OpenBC, uh, OpenBCI, uh, IWire, right? And he did so much for you guys. Yeah, that yeah, there was, job. yeah, there was a developer who um, he was one of our players and he found we were having spikes, we had like spikes of people when there was media coverage and they would come in and ask the same question over and over and over again. And the admins, like the, the moderator players in the game were like didn't want to lose their enthusiasm. So this player like very like cordially wrote us and said, like, Hey, it would be okay if I wrote a bot that like answered frequently asked questions automatically. And we were like, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> and then we ended up um, he ended up coming to Princeton to do um, basically half a year abroad. We went to a the White House, it was great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really great example. I, and when you say get involved, the uh, reason I think the first question I'd ask is, okay, well, what are you looking for? What are you trying to do? So, I mean, I, from my world in the software industry, uh, people would ask, like, okay, like, I really want to get a job in the software, or what should I do? And a very common answer is find an open source project, start contributing. That way you start getting feedback as if you would in, in the real professional life. Um, the same thing with this, like if you want to get involved with science, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, there I can rattle off a few projects where software engineering is directly contributing to advancements in neuroscience. So this is a project called Thunder that's out of Genalia Farm, uh, which is doing big data infrastructure for, call it a terabyte sized uh, data sets. Um, it's actually, they're really cool data sets. Um, uh, if you can, you can actually see neurons light up in real time like a Christmas tree. They're doing it over full mice, uh, full pieces of mice brain, full uh, entire zebrafish. You can actually see it computing in real time. And so, uh, so that's an example. So Thunder, I think, is excellent. There's another group called NeuroData that's out of Johns Hopkins. Same thing. These are, these are computer science professors also in the bioengineering department who are investing heavily in building infrastructure, specifically building open source infrastructure. And so um, I think I talked to one of those guys who actually got into the lab by actively contributing and then professor knew that, okay, if this guy wants his PhD, I already know what he can do. Um, so there's, there's a needs for that, but there's also what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, if, you're, if you want to just further your knowledge out of curiosity, there's things like uh, the example of Nick, like you've done a cool project, put it up for a reaction. And even in that in itself, I would, I would classify as an open source interaction. I would 
Actually, that, that was a great answer about uh, depending on what you're looking for. First, if you're into, if you're really inspired after that, make sure you come and talk to me first after backing the Kickstarter uh, for OpenBCI. Uh, but there's so many ways of getting involved, and depending on what you're looking for, is it for the science, is it for pushing further, is it for your own sake of like just getting experience to get a better job or something? But in any case, it's worth just like going out there and finding a project that uh, inspires you. I think that there's no lack of projects out there, and other other than that, just create your own and gather people and start working on it. Add one thing. Um, so there, you know, I think we're um, just to, just to, this is kind of unrelated, but related. Uh, it's like an extension of this topic. But basically, um, <laughs> as you're creating things, you know, uh, don't be afraid to share them. So I look back on all of the things that I created, and I only shared. 5% of them, and some of those things impacted many people, and you know, and I'm, and I'm grateful that for that now, and I look back and I think about all the things that I was just like ashamed to share at the time, because I was like embarrassed about mistakes that I might have made, and it's just like, oh, like in retrospect, I'm like, why didn't I put that up there? Like, I'd love to look at that now, and now it's on some little hard drive on a computer somewhere that is dead, and it's like, you know, so, you know, I just, I would say that like, you gotta just kind of put yourself out there, and, and, and just, you know, even if you think maybe you've made mistakes and it looks stupid, just put it out there. Because if it is stupid, people won't look at it. So. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to jump back to this global theme that we've been having about transitioning out of the traditional academic model. And I know one hesitation that a lot of researchers have in terms of crowdsourcing their data collection, especially with things like the OpenBCI or these consumer headsets that are being released not to not the OpenBCI. The OpenBCI is wonderful. <laughs> is data quality. So how do you ensure that the task you asked people to do outside of the lab is actually what they're doing, or that there wasn't just a funny sensor on the headset that's giving you an artifact in the data? How are some ways that you can see that you can control for that in order to be able to really use these massive data sets and know that you're drawing accurate conclusions? Connor, you made a face. Yeah, so um, <laughs> there's a project that we're working on now, and actually it's being pretty much spearheaded by Tian, who's sitting in the crowd, um, who's a co-organizer of Neurotech NYC, uh, and then his good friend, Andrew. Um, so there, there's this, basically, it's a web interface called OpenEXP. Uh, it's like in its alpha, pre-alpha state, um, but it, it's coming along greatly, and, and great. And basically what it is, is it's a browser-based experiment, kind of like menu, where you can just hope the idea is that scientists will come along and uh, do some browser-based trigger, trigger-based response stimuli test or experiment, and users will be able to submit their data. Um, and I guess the hope here is that what we can do is we can we can put out some uh, I guess like calibration protocols where uh, as a generator of data, the first thing you do is you go through some type of calibration where there's a known uh, series of signals that are being submitted to you and, and, and these signals have known responses, like the things that I was doing on the screen earlier. So like, break your jaw, blink your eyes, close your eyes and get alpha. Get two minutes of that and basically have like some kind of quality score based on your data and then have the data submitted be measured or like have an, a metric applied to it that follows this kind of like your quality score. So that's just like an idea, but you know, open EXP is basically, you know, the engine for that. How do we get people to share this data in a way that's like well architected and we know it has some like some metric attached to it that gives it validation. I would say that in the iWire sense, it's a little bit of a different answer because what we're trying to do is ensure that the 3D neurons that are reconstructed in the game are actually accurate. Um, and we do that with a pretty sophisticated system of checks and balances. So as the players play the game more, they tend to get a lot better at the game. So as the levels in the game, as you actually advance through, there's only a few levels that are very hard to unlock. But as you unlock them, they're dependent on accuracy and activity. Um, and when people submit at the end of at the end of reconstructing a cube, it in real time cross references what they added with the segments, the 3D chunks that were added by other players on the same cube. So we actually have dramatically improved the um, efficiency, the throughput of iWire by improving our system of kind of real-time consensus, we call it, so our, our accuracy kind of system, our confidence in each cube. We used to have to have anywhere from, you know, 11 to 18 people do each cube, and now we have four. Um, and we do this, you know, you level up, you become a scout and a scythe, and it gives you these extra powers that 
um, because we trust you as a player. Um, they can actually edit the, the consensus of the overall community and they can work in pairs to remove errors. Um, and what we find is that statistically the top players in iWire, who by the way spend like 30, 40, 50 hours a week in the game for a very, for like months upon months upon months, <laughs> um, they're as good as our um, MIT and Princeton trained neural tracers. So it's about giving trust to your community once you feel I think my, my mechanical response to that is that it's an old question in a new context. So any experiment needs to have checks and balances on that. that that's experimental design. So yes, it's, it's very interesting that it's now can be done. OpenEXP is rad, by the way. So you have to follow the GitHub, like, yeah. Yeah, convince me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's up to the, the experimenter. And so if the data comes garbage in, like, that should be detected, and that, that, as Connor said, can be controlled for. I think that we're seeing a new paradigm as well with like bridging the crowd, like bringing the crowdsourcing uh, into into the field and research. And I think that will develop like tools and like more paradigm or like uh, protocols that will enable, as you just said, like to make sure that you don't get garbage in. I think that we're just get, getting started, like getting a lot of data, uh, and now we're, we'll need to curate that data uh, at the entry level. So I think that will just kind of like because uh, I, I think it's a bit new. Uh, that we have like that amount of data and like from science outsourcing it to uh, to, pe to people to the community like iWire and stuff like that and I think it will discover more like tools and protocols uh, as Connor was were, were saying earlier as, uh, as well as like scoring uh, the, uh, the the data that that comes in um, but I and, and I, I think that the brain data will, will be really interesting how you filter that because a lot of uh, brain data with no context not much you can do with just uh, on, on Unless you look at baseline and stuff like that, but I think that we uh, like the context, so we'll develop more tools to structure these experiments as we go. I believe. Thank you. So my next question is going to be more about what happens with the findings from these studies, and specifically with regards to data anonymization. So if you were to run one of these massive, large data set studies and find some really, really accurate predictor of neurodegenerative disease, how do you go about disseminating that? Is there a responsibility to tell the people in the study that this is what you found? Who gets to decide that? <laughs> Sorry. It's a tough one. Um, does anyone want to take this while I think about it? Uh, well, yeah, we have some examples in the field now, sure. right? Well, like, there's the interaxon in the 1100 person EEG study, right? Where, and so, what do they do for that? I mean, for what? Do you not, do they? Well, what do they find? I don't know the study. Well, so like, this, is like the new, the, this is the new world of being able to study N equals 1100 for an EEG. I mean, they, they, and that's great, because like, once again, another example of a private industry doing something that academia used to do. So Princeton, I, I think that before I'd heard about this 1,100 person study done by Interaxon, the highest number I heard was a Princeton EEG study that was on the order of 50 people, uh, all watching a movie and trying to sync up EEG results that way. Um, I don't have a good answer for the ethics of that. I mean, I, it, you know, but I will say, so the theory, like, I think it's a really interesting theoretical question. All I can give is the practical one, where probably from the EEG, I don't imagine getting a Definitive enough measure of your of a, of, a, of a I don't know actually no I don't even want to say that reductively I think it's an interesting question I would want to know and that's probably something you set up once again it's an experimental design yeah, yeah. that's what I would say I would say yeah, there are already instances of, of studies like this um, you know or just kind of a and I think it ultimately should be you know if there's a chance of discovering something like this you should basically let the study know ahead of time like if you find something sure let me know or nope I'd rather be Totally ignorant, so. <laughs> okay, before we start wrapping up, I want to jump gears again and talk a little bit about brain stimulation, especially since one of the Kickstarter stretch goals is a TDCS shield, which really means that you should all go back to the open BCI because I want to be able to have a brain stimulation add-on pretty please. <clears throat> How do you feel about open source brain stimulation as compared to brain recording. Do you think there is some kind of fundamental difference? Or do you think that people should just be allowed to do whatever they want to their own brains? 
and report findings afterwards. Um, so I think, you know, people will always treat themselves like scientific guinea pigs. And, you know, this is, so we are, we are aware of this, and the DIY TDCS community has been around for five years now, you know, zapping themselves in different ways, maxing out the amperage, trying different voltages, trying ACF, TCF, TACS, different, different techniques. But I think, you know, like, one thing that we want to do is create a system that we know is safe, that we have, that we know is at least as safe as it possibly can be. So we, you know, like at OpenBCR, we are cautiously optimistic about the potential of TECS. I think the studies to date show that, like, there are just as many studies showing that there is statistical significance as there are, you know, studies that show there there, there is no statistical significance. So it basically balances itself out. Um, but there have been a number of individual case studies where, you know, someone with severe depression or uh, schizophrenia has tried everything and then tries TCS and it works. And even if that's a placebo effect, it works. Um, and so, you know, I think what's important is maintaining, you know, like strict safety regulations and creating systems that, uh, you know, are well designed, well engineered, and, you know, also enable kind of a ubiquitous platform for people to begin doing crowdsourced research to, to figure out does this thing actually do anything. And so, at OpenBCI, that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to build a TDCS shield that we know is as safe as it possibly can be, and then let people talk and work together to figure out, you know, as opposed to just having a bunch of, like, you know, individual guinea pigs off in the world someplace, kind of, like, killing themselves because they, they turned the knobs up too far. Like, let's, let's work together to make sure that we're not doing that, so. I mean, I don't really know a lot about the space, but I mean, it's part of the difference, right? One is passively, or, I guess, actively recording what's going on in the brain, sending stimulation into the brain to change the underlying activity, right? Um, and again, I don't really know a lot about it, but if people are going to be experimenting with it, it's just important that they know what's unknown and that they know that if there are risks, we may not know what they all are. In baseball, tie goes to the runner, right? I think, oh wait, why am I asking you? Anyway, no, it's, it's it's and so like, I think that like, in, in a, it, I guess that, anyway, that's right. Okay, is the, the, the analogy is like if you're going to err on one side, I'll try to err on being giving like, an emphasis on human like self determinism than trying to like arbitrarily set something. Like if, if people are going to shock their brain too far, then I would rather give people that right than, than try to take it away. Um, the uh, and I, I agree. I, I think it is a pretty cool. I think it is the, the most in, in the horizon of neurotech. The whole idea of TDCS is certainly probably one of the closest things on the horizon that gets people excited. Um, and we don't really know, and I agree, that there's just as much interesting stuff as there is absolute junk. And, and sifting that out is going to be a big thing. But from the engineering point of view, I mean, part of my undergraduate research was setting up bombs on bridges, um, legally. Uh, <laughs> and what we were doing there is we were perturbing the system, and then we would, we would cover these bridges with sensors and then see how the bridge reacts. And that's how we were able to create models for what the structures actually did. I think there's a fine analogy with the brain there. And I think it's worth kind of telling a little like sub story here is we brought Connor over to our lab at MIT today. And it was a perfect event, like what I think is the ideal interaction I would, I would want to see between the open source community and the science community. So like any, any good collaboration is like, I know how to do X, but I don't know how to do Y. And the other person says, well, I know how to do Y, but I don't know how to do X. Like, let's hang out. And just to have people from the academic side saying, hey, you know, I've got this really interesting idea about the way we could do this new sort of processing combining EEG and TDCS. And then for Connor to say, cool, we can build the TDCS plus EEG, but we never thought about that math before you mentioned it. And so those kind of like that, like those kind of interactions are what we want in the future of TDCS. But very similar to Amy, I'm gonna say it's kind of like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of like the, I don't, I don't I don't know what the future of it is, but it is something I think is important to push on. Yeah, I, I think it, it kind of wraps up uh, also like other question that we raised before about uh, the experiment uh, for uh, like the public. How do you validate the data? Because I believe that we'll, like there will always be guinea pigs. People will just try stuff on themselves because pace is just too slow. So like if TDCS be is it is being proven like 15 years from now, people don't want to wait 15 years. A lot of people will just try it as long as it's kind of stays safe, safe enough for trying. Themselves, I think that people will try. Uh, is that valid science? 
I think so. Uh, I think it needs to be, oh, quote unquote. I think that it's science. So a lot of people, when you have like a large uh, enough sample, like a lot of people just doing that, the problem right now is that they're, they're doing it uh, in their basement and posting on, on Reddit stuff like, hey, here's my amp meter, uh, why is the current too high? And you're like, oh my god, don't, don't do it. No, don't, don't. And, and, and I think that all these results are, are valid for science. I'm not encouraging people to like just mess around, but I think that tools that are kind of safe enough will bring people to kind of, because they're going to try them themselves. So might as well just get the results, get some data out of it uh, to push the, the, the field further. Because I think at the pace, uh, people are just like eager for, too quick for science to catch up. Uh, whether it's the brain anti-aging, I think is the best, the best example as well in the field. Uh, like you don't want to be, the, the, if there is anti-aging, if it really happens, you don't want to be the last one to die, right? Um, so that would kind of suck. So, you, you, so people will just try on themselves first, and I think that it kind of opens a new paradigm as well of just like catching with pace and science. And uh, I think that will like with citizen science empowering people with the right tool and the right information because I think that it's the field themselves themselves that it's kind of sending the wrong message of TDCS. Like you're just gonna zap your brain, become like so smart that people are just like doing it thinking that they, they're gonna like unlock their brain and stuff like that. So I think again, the wow factor, the hopes and hypes uh, that we need to kind of like take care of the message that we're sending out there. Speaking of dying, if someone gives you a TDCS machine that plugs in the wall, stop. <laughs> okay, so speaking of hype, to wrap things up, I want you all to come up with one thing that you are genuinely the most passionate about in neurotechnology so that other people can be inspired to do some of the amazing things that you're all doing. I'm a little bit in awe of every single one of you. Uh, it can be your own problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think like the thing that that makes me want to just like wake up in the morning and go to my shop every day uh, is, you know, the knowledge that like, I discovered what I do at age 24 and you know, and it's as e it's easy enough for a 15 year old to do it, right? So I think that you know, if if we could make that epiphany happen at an earlier age, where people are excited and inspired and empowered with with human computer interface devices, then you know, like, then everybody wins in the long run. And so that's kind of that's a, that's the thing that drives me forward is how do we just continue to inspire people, lower the barrier of entry, make it more cost effective, and and like really, really embed the, this whole movement with a sense of uh, learning and, and collaboration. So, that's it. Thanks. Um, what I'm really excited about kind of in the long term as far as neurotechnology goes is really understanding what's going on when brains are thriving. Uh, I'm intensely curious to know what's happening just when brains are kicking ass. Like, if I can figure out trends and like where new projects come from, or when, what conditions I need, precursors to new ideas evolve, or like when I'm particularly creative, could I perhaps put myself in more of those situations? And if everyone knew that about themselves, how would that change the way that we go about living our lives and interacting with one another, you know? If we understand how brains thrive, then doesn't that put us in a better position to potentially amplify our own natural abilities? So that's kind of what I'm really excited about. And then on um, just a fun side, like I'm really stoked about robots and brain controlled robotic exoskeletons because I would love to be able to do the Cirque du Soleil type, you know, Olympic athlete style things and I just want to be able to control a robot with my mind and have it, you know, take, you know, I want to be able to jump like 40 feet into clips and that. <laughs> Uh, cool. I, lo I love ending on this question because we ended with some provocations. Um, the provocation that gets me pretty excited uh, on my day-to-day -day work in the lab uh, is looking at super-resolution genetics across large amounts of tissue. So that's something that right now is pretty far away from human impact. What is the, what is the super-resolution genetics? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just looking at a way of looking at our, our, our genetic Nerd. information. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's just a grad student. In, a, yeah, in, a, in our brain, I think it's going to be a very interesting new field. But what's in the, in the macro picture, the provocation of uh, starting with something that is, is, is nitty gritty science, synapse level biology, and then one day being able to say that's human impact. Um, like that, we, don't, we have very few examples of that right now, I think, with, with neuroscience. And so seeing that connect 
the phrase I like to use is cognitive connectomics. Like, we're not we're not there yet, right? But one day we will be able to look at these these. Uh, and right now it's it's. If I say that in like a pure academic world, like I would get like locked out. Like, uh, not there yet. But like to me that is that is an interesting provocation. And the third provocation I would like to really push on is a celebration of science. Um, it, from from being in these different worlds of, of, of software engineering and entrepreneurship and, and product design, like they're like everyone sees themselves as as creatives. Um, like designers with the scarves, I mean, like the turtlenecks. Like you, we we look at we look at uh, like Kanye West. We look at like our big creatives, like quote unquote creatives. And I look at what scientists do, and to me, it's the exact same thing. It is going through the exact same process. If you don't know if it's done, you're not really you're you're, you're adhering to a, a mix of what the outside constraints are, but you're going much more on what your internal sense of quality is. And I think that process needs to be celebrated uh, and, and given the same respect that. Um, that the people on, on stages with microphones <laughs> uh, have, have been getting. So I, I think that's the third provocation, is, is giving science the credit uh, for being creative that, that it deserves. For me, I mean, uh, there are so many things that I'm just passionate about. Like the future, we live in an amazing time in history. So the future looks pretty amazing to me. I'm pretty optimistic, uh, pretty as optimistic by, by default. but. Uh, for me, the, the thing that excites me the most is really about uh, redefining what it is to be human, in a way. The more that we're going to understand the brain and different technology and the, the, the relationship between humans and technology, I think that is what is just fascinating, how we're going to evolve, what's going to be the next, maybe not now, not our generation, maybe the next one or the, the future one, but I think that we're going to be, we're, we're, we need to ask ourselves the question of where, where we're heading. And, but I would just like, again, to ask another question quickly about uh, if you have to pick like binary, yes and no, uh, do you consider yourself more optimistic or pessimistic? Do you consider that the future is going to be more utopia or dystopia? Uh, so who would go more for optimistic about the future? And who would be about the opposite, that we're running into a wall? Ask after the next presidential election. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who's getting elected. <laughs> All right, love it. Yep, that's that's it for me. Thank you all so much, and thank you all for sitting here for such a long time. There is still some food left. There is still beer, coffee, tea. I hope you hang around and meet amazing people. Thank you. Thank you.